21 verses 14 through 20. You have to say amen. 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 Read it from the New International Standard Version. Verse 14. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. Some translations say the child began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. <clears throat> then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Haran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Yes, sir. From where? Egypt. Egypt. <laughs> from where? Egypt. Egypt. More on that later. Right now, hold those Bibles up. You know how we roll. <laughs> this is God's word. This is God's word. I receive it. I receive it. I believe it. I believe it. I decree it. I decree it. God's word. God's word is a lamp unto my feet. A lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my path. And a light unto my path. This is a church. This is a church. Where everybody is somebody. Where everybody is somebody. And Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. One Lord. One Lord. One faith. One faith. One baptism. One baptism. One sign. One sign. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated in God's presence. Thank you, your urshers. Today, for just a few minutes, looks like I'm already behind the eight ball with time here, so instead of the 45-minute version, I'll condense it down to about 15 minutes uh, on the condition that you say amen every two minutes. Amen. All right. Amen. All right. All right. Today, I want to ask you this question and attempt to answer it sermonically. How do we handle our scars? How do we handle our scars? How do we handle it? How do you handle your scars? Amen? Amen? That's the question that I want to pose to you today on this second Sunday in February. As you know, we pause to reacquaint and remind ourselves of the ominous history that is black history. Amen? Amen? And we remind ourselves that black history mom was the brainchild of Carter G. Woodson, who was born in Virginia in 1875 as the son of former slaves. Black history mom, Dr. Woodson, wanted to recognize that black accomplishments yeah. were ignored in standard history textbooks. And he wanted to bolster a wider knowledge of black achievement. Now, it's important that we honor our history, amen? Yeah. The church is also important, not only that we honor our history, but that we know our history. Amen. Amen. And in knowing our history, we must 
must know that black history did not begin with slavery. Amen. Right. Amen. Oh, we got quiet there. Amen. Black history did not begin with slavery. Amen. Amen. The, the, in, in, in fact, the Bible is a multicultural book. I'll say that again. The Bible is a multicultural book. In other words, there are different races of people in the Bible. Now, if we cannot accept that our Bible is a multicultural book, then how can we accept the presence of multicultural churches? Hmm. cannot accept that the Bible is a multicultural book, how can we accept multicultural churches? I'm just trying to make a point here that our presence in the Bible is just as relevant today as it was thousands of years ago when the Bible was off. Amen? All right. We need to know this. We need to know this. We need to know that Ethiopians, Cushites, Egyptians, and Hebrews are all terms that describe dark-skinned people. It describes us, y'all. Amen? Ethiopia, in fact, is mentioned 45 times in the Old Testament. Africa is mentioned as, is mentioned more than any other landmass in the Bible. In fact, the term Middle East, which includes Africa, was connected to the Holy Land until 1859 when the Suez Canal was built. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Why is this important that we, that we honor the black presence in the Bible? Well, I'll give you one good reason why it's important. It's important because so many of our sisters and brothers in our community have, been, have fallen victim to what we call the white man's book right. kind of thing. Amen? Right. In other words, they have bought into the notion, the false notion, that the Bible is the white man's book and that Christianity is the white man's religion. Amen? Amen. And so, so, so it's important. Now, let me put a footnote on that. They have fallen into that kind of thinking because of what they heard. Not because, of, in most cases, of what they uh, sought to understand themselves. Amen? Amen. They, they, they did not uh, indulge into uh, any kind of scholarship, in other words. But it was based on what they heard. But it's not based on what we hear. If you open your Bible, you'll see. Again, Ethiopians, Cushites, Egyptians, Hebrews, all of these terms describe dark-skinned people. Right. And that, that, that God was using a multiplicity of people to achieve his purposes. Amen? Amen. And so, so, so it's important that we dispel this, this notion of the white man's book or the white man's religion kind of thinking. No, no, no. It's not the white man's book. It's not the white man's religion. In fact, if you do your scholarly research, if you really get down to the bones of the gospel and the uh, Old Testament, you'll see that a lot of people were dark-skinned. Then yeah. what you believe. Amen. 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 You'll see that. You'll see that. You'll see that. I know that we grew up uh, watching cinematic versions of Jesus on TV and, and Moses and, and they all were pale skinned and we you know we grew up on that. But if you do your research, you'll see a different story. It's, it's important, y'all. It's important to understand the black presence in the Bible because it, it provides us a connection. To people who look like us, and 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 and, and it, it also provides a connection to the struggles that these people, these men and women of God, endured.
and it shows us how to overcome similar struggles. Amen? Amen. Hagar, Hagar was a, 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 a prime example. Hagar was a sister. Amen. I say, I say, I say, Hagar was a sister. She was. Boy, that quiet in here. She was. Well, oh, wait a minute. Why do you say she was a sister? Hagar was an Egyptian. That's right. Now, back to the question I asked at the beginning of the sermon. He got a son. They got a son for Hagar's, they got a wife for Hagar's son from where? Egypt. Egypt. Where was Egypt? In Africa. In Africa. Yeah. Amen. I'm just doing a little teaching here, y'all. Yeah. It was in Africa. Hagar was an Egyptian sister. She was an Egyptian slave. Yeah, she was a handmaid of Sarah. And get this, Hagar was the Bible's first enslaved sex victim. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Before there was Me Too, before there was Harvey Weinstein, Look here, there was Hagar. Hagar was really the first biblical victim of sexual misconduct recorded. She was a handmaiden of Sarah, and Abraham impregnated her at Sarah's request. Amen. She, 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 she was she was she was a victim of a scandal. A scandalous misconduct. This was a sister, a single mother. She was left out. She was locked out. And her status resembles that of the black slave women in America who were at the mercy of their slave owners and would, re would repeatedly be raped during slavery. I tell you, Hagar, Hagar was in a situation. Hagar was facing a struggle. And, and, and what it tells us today is that, is that Hagar bore some scars common to all of us. And, and, and the bottom line is, uh, your scar may not be Hagar's, or uh, Hagar's may not be the same as Hagar's scar, but guess what? All of us got some scars. Yeah, all of us got some scars. All of us got some scars. And, and, and Hagar bore scars coming to all of us. But guess what? Her testimony points us to this one unalterable truth that God is a healer of our predicament. Yes. That God can take our struggle yes. and make something out of it. Amen? Amen. It's important. It's important that we understand that Hagar has scars. And guess what? Guess what? In developing a theology of scars, as I like to call it, we must understand that scars, or that a scar, comes from a wound. In other words, you can't have a scar if you have not been wounded in some way. All right, all right. In fact, scars are a good sign that you are recovering from your wounds. So in other words, brothers and sisters, all of us sitting in this room today are what we call wounded people. Yes, sir. Come on now. All of us in this room today are what we call wounded people. Everybody, everybody in this room has got a wound of some sort. Amen? All of us, all of us have been wounded. In some ways, we've been wounded physically. In some ways, we've been wounded mentally. In some ways, we've been wounded uh, spiritually. But all of us share one thing in common. That is, we are all wounded people. Amen? In fact, the church is a hospital for wounded people. Amen? So if you got a wound, guess what? You're in the right place. You're in the right place at the right time on the right day. You are here because you are wounded and your wound is reflected by your scar. Yes. We got scars. We got scars. We got scars. And then, and, 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 and we can, what Hagar invites us to see is a new way of seeing our scars. Yeah. 
that we can, we can look past our trauma and become meaningful. Our scars can become meaningful and positive. In fact, we can use our scars as grounds for a brand new future. Amen. If you got a scar, you have a brand new future. That's what Hagar is telling us. That's what Hagar, this story, is telling us. She was, she was in a situation in which she was wounded. It was typical of how women were treated in that day and time. She had no rights that a man was bound to respect. She had to get permission to leave the house. She had to cover herself constantly. Hagar was in a situation in which she was wounded. Yeah. And her scars point us today in 2019. Her scars, Hagar's scars can, can, can point us to a new meaning, a new understanding of what it means to have a meaningful and positive life. Yeah. So if you got scars, don't worry. Your scars are from your wounds. But get this, if you got scars, know number one, that your scars are beautiful scars. <coughs> all of us, I said earlier, that all of us are wounded. Yes, all of us are wounded. And because all of us are wounded, we carry our scars from the wound. But guess what? In Christ, our scars are beautiful scars. Amen. Why are you calling my scar beautiful? Reverend, I'm glad you asked. Look at what it says. It says that, that Hagar wandered in the desert of Beersheba. Get this, get this. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Beersheba in the Bible, in its Hebrew translation, means perfection. It means promise. God was, was sending Hagar into the direction of perfection and promise even with her scars. In other words, folks, when everything seems to be falling apart, we can trust God it's all coming together. Right. Because we are in a place of perfection. We are in a place of promise. God is leading us even though it appears that we are wandering. It appears that things are falling apart, but it is when things are falling apart that we must trust God that they are all coming together. That's why the writer says in Romans 8 and 28 that all things, all things right. come together, work That's together right. for our good. You know, we like to think, we like to think when that, when that verse says all things, we like to substitute the rain, likes to substitute all good things. Right. You know, Money in the, in the bank, relationships going well, children going well. But guess what? All things is inclusive of what? All things. Setbacks, disappointments, yes, upsets, yes, pain, failure. Did you know that God can use those things too to work toward your good? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. All things work together for our good. It's all coming together, y'all. It's all coming together. When it seems like it's falling apart, yeah. it's all coming together. All right. Don't be like Chicken Little. Don't be like Chicken Little going down the road and, 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 and one acorn fell on the head and she said, the world is coming to an end. Have a stronger faith than that. Have a stronger faith than know that God is still in control. Yes, yes, yes. They are. They are shows us that our scars are beautiful. So wear your scar in a beautiful way. But not only that, she also shows us or tells us to embrace our place or to become stronger in our scars. The Bible says, God says to Hagar, lift the boy up. Lift the boy up. Lift the boy up. Uh, become stronger. Did you know that when you lift something, it makes you stronger? You know, I'm a transformation coach. You know that I gotta, I gotta talk about. Sometimes I talk about the importance of, of doing resistance exercise, the, the importance of moving around for 10 minutes a day, uh, or to to escalate your heart rate, making sure that you are a, a, a in good shape physically. When you lift something, it makes you stronger. 
stronger. Yes, sir. In other words, in other words, in fact, when you lift weights, your muscles get stronger. And if your muscles get stronger, your body gets stronger, your bones get stronger, you have a stronger life. God says to Hagar, lift the boy up. Yeah. Become stronger. In other words, do not sit around and allow fear to paralyze your faith. Don't allow fear to paralyze your faith. Lift. Get stronger where you are. Get stronger where you are. Get stronger where you are. This this obstacle that you face now, this challenge that you face now, this struggle that you face now, it did not come to vanquish you. It came to make you stronger. I'm convinced that, that, that Zion, even now in this, in this period of transition, and it, when it seems like things aren't coming together, so to speak, when it seems like that, that we're getting weaker, we're actually getting stronger in God's grace, in God's spirit. And, and, and God's spirit is being pronounced on this place. It's making us stronger. Paul said it like this, that my power is made perfect in weakness. Yeah. Like how Proverbs 12, 25, listen, anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down. But guess what? A good word makes it strong. Yes, sir. You got a good word for yourself today. Say something good about yourself. Say something good about your situation. Say something good about your life. Even if you are going through something today, say something good. Yes, sir. Say something positive. I am powerful. I am strong. The Bible says in Job, let the weak say I am strong. Say it. Say it. I am strong. I am strong. No matter what I'm facing, I am strong. I am able to overcome it. Let the weak say I am strong. And last year, my friends, I'm going to prepare to close. I told you I would give you the 10 to 15-minute version. Uh, I think I'm on my way to the 40 minute version, but praise God anyway. Uh, the Bible, it, it, lastly, it tells us, Hagar tells us that we must not only know that our scars are beautiful, and, and not only must we embrace our place and become stronger, but lastly, we must see the possibilities in our scars. Then yeah, God, the verse says, open her eyes. Yes. He opened her eyes. In Christ, we can see ourselves and our circumstances in a different perspective. Yes, sir. In fact, don't say, I'm going through. <laughs> say it said, I am growing through. Amen. Because when you grow through something, you're much better off spiritually. We are not going through. We are growing through. Open your eyes and see success in failure. See the possibilities in impossibilities. See the victory in defeat. Every burden church has a built-in blessing. I'll say it again. Every burden has a built-in blessing. It doesn't matter what you're going through. If you look closely enough, if you, if you, if you, if you, uh, if your relationship with Christ is deep enough, you will see the blessing in your burden. Yes. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter. As I said, let the weak say, I am strong. In other words, I am whole. I am perfect. I am strong. I am powerful. I am loving. I am happy in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Last week I asked you if you're happy in the Lord. Happy in the Lord means that you have that, that joy, unspeakable joy yes, yes. in your life. When you wake up in the morning, you wake up joyful. Yes, knowing that it's a brand new day and it's a brand new opportunity. It's a brand new potentiality that whatever you're going through, yes. that you can, like Hagar, wear your skull like a star. God can transform stars into stars. I hear the writer of John say, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory 
that has overcome the world. And then James puts it like this in James 1 and 2. Consider it pure victory. Yes, sir. When you face trials. When you face trials, you are already victorious. You are already a winner. In fact, you are winning even when you're losing. Yes, Look at it like that. You are winning even when you are losing. Why do you say that? Because the Bible says we are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. And then the writer Isaiah puts it like this. They that wait upon the Lord yes, shall what? Shall renew their strength. And shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk to not faint. So we can run today. We can run with patience. We can run with compassion. We can run with long suffering. We can run with the Spirit of God inside of us because we are more than conquerors. And when we run, we already know what the outcome of the race is going to be. We already know that we are winners in Jesus Christ. All right, all right. We are winners. As I close today, promise yourself that you will use Hagar's story and that you will take this story and that you will make yourself a promise based on Hagar's story. That God opened her eyes and she saw her situation from a different perspective. Well, 2019 is already underway. We're already almost midway through February. Promise yourself that you will forgive and forget. Yes, sir. Promise yourself that. Promise yourself that 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 that, that you won't subscribe to this toxic philosophy that says forgive. I'll forgive, but I won't forget. <laughs> What a toxic right. way to live. All right. That you'll forgive, but you won't forget. What, what a toxic way to live. Forgive, but don't forget is the installment plan yes, for mental and emotional suicide. All right. Promise yourself that you'll forgive yes, and forget in the new year. I'm just trying to help you out here. All right. And then promise that you will lose more arguments then you win. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you will lose. In other words, you're not going to focus on winning every argument. That's you, right. Do you know somebody got to win every argument? Yeah. Every time there's a debate, they got to win. They always got to have the last word. Don't yeah. be that person. Promise yourself that you will lose more arguments yeah. than you win. And then lastly, yeah. promise yourself that you will not judge yourself more than you love yourself. Right, right. The fact is, we are, we are our own worst critic. All right, all right. I know that to be true because I do the same thing. So many dreams have wilted and died under the weight of severe self-doubt and criticism. You're right. Some people are so hard on themselves, they loathe to look in the mirror. You're right. Promise yourself in 2019. That you will love yourself more than you judge yourself. God is the healer of our wounds. And because we've been wounded, we got scars. But guess what? We can wear our scars beautifully. Our scars tell us that we are healing. Don't get stuck on the wounded part. Move forward in faith and rejoice in the stars. Yeah. Because guess what? Jesus was also wounded. Yes, he was. He was wounded for our transgressions. Yes, he, was. he carried the cross of the God this hill. He was crucified. Oh, yes. It pierced him in the side. Yes. But guess what? Early Sunday morning, yes. he got up with all power. He see that star. Yes. But he got up. Yes. And he showed us that we can live a productive all right, all and a right. fruitful life yeah. in spite of our scar. Yeah. The door of the church is open right now. Maybe you have a scar all right, all from right. a wound, but you are more focusing on the wounded part.
then rejoicing in the beauty of your stars. I invite you to come. Let us pray with you in an intercessory manner that God will heal you and that you will be blessed even though you have beautiful stars. All right, all right. If you're here out of the ark of safety, you've never asked Christ to be your personal Savior, we offer you the opportunity right now. Come by letter, Christian experience, or as a candidate for baptism. We offer you Christ, oh my brother. We offer you Christ, oh my sister. He will give you life yeah. more abundantly. All you have to do yes. is yes. come. Yeah.